Ben the Bar Guy back with another video to help you make better drinks and today we're going to start a new video series on how to open your own bar. Particularly if you're a bartender looking to open their first concept, their first bar, where do you begin? It can be quite intimidating to try and open a bar these days so I wanted to make sure that everyone here knows that it's possible, you can get there. And what we're gonna focus on is concept, space, neighborhood, sales projections, and we're gonna try and get into the laws and regulations in neighborhoods that you may be looking to open and what you need to look out for. A little personal news, I've moved to Ohio, as I mentioned in my last video, and I have signed a lease on a new bar, so I'm hoping to open that later this year. I am working hard to open my own bar right now, and I thought maybe you guys are in the same boat, and I want you to feel like you can do it, you can get there, because I'm gonna be going through it and I'm getting there. So stay tuned. And as always, guys, the better drinks. Let's do this. All right, everybody. This is a video series really focused on how to open a bar, particularly if you're a bartender with a concept, right? You're coming from where I came from. Not a lot of money, not a lot of capital. You're not going to buy your own building, probably. If you, by the way, great idea, definitely do it. But you're really just a bartender with a great idea. How do you get there? This is the video for you. Today, we're going to start with five things that I think are essential to understand before you even start asking people for money, before you even start spreading word, right? You're going to need to do these five things. You're going to need to understand these five things and that's your concept for the bar or restaurant the space that you're going to put it in and what you need in the neighborhood you're going to need to understand implicitly what's going on in the neighborhood at all times as far as drinking and eating goes sales projections what to do in order to get to a sales projection and five that's laws and the regulations in the neighborhood you're moving into what to look out for particularly in the lease if you know these things, I promise you, you can be on your way to opening your own bar. So let's get started. The first is concept, and I'm gonna say that space, number two, they're really interchangeable. Space, concept. A lot of people go out with a concept already in mind. They know what they wanna open, so then they already know the space they need. They'll just go hunt the space they need. But a lot of bar owners, maybe more experienced bar owners or bar owners that have lots of concepts running around in their head, will go out and find the perfect space and then put the concept that fits it into it. And you can do it either way. There's no wrong way to do it. Most first bar owners are gonna start with a concept and try and find a space for it. So let's start with your concept. Let's make sure it's the right kind of concept. I had a very smart bartender who wants to own her own bar come talk to me one day about this. And her concept was, I want a small cocktail bar with only like maybe six seats and I'm gonna bartend it all the time and it's gonna be awesome. And I said, no doubt that it's gonna be awesome because I know you're a great bartender. But have you thought about what your income would be working all the time? Now you might be collecting tips, that's great, but don't you wanna own? Owning implies that you're not bartending every day. And while you might wanna own that bar that only has six seats and is quaint and everybody loves, what can you sell there? How many dollars does each seat make you in a restaurant? One of the best things I ever learned was that I found out on a yearly basis what each seat in a space I was looking at was worth. How important it is to get that seat filled. If you are a full bar and you only have six seats, you can't make that much money. It's impossible. You can't even make that much in tips. You're just, your sales aren't going to be high, especially if you're a cocktail bar. Each seat in a restaurant can be $35,000 in profit a year. Easily. So immediately I explained that to her and she got it right away. She was like, ah, that's why you don't see the many of these bars. I said, yeah, that's exactly why you don't see many of these bars. There's not much money to be made, right? And opening a six seat cocktail bar. Now, doesn't mean that's not possible. There was a great space in New York for a long time called Lantern's Keep that built a small space, maybe 20, 25 seats, but they had a unique situation where the hotel they were located in had a space they weren't really using and they got a great deal on opening back there. So low overhead made less seats more profitable. And they only needed two employees to service all 20 to 25 seats at a time. Bar only had four seats. It was an interesting concept. Their sales maybe approached 2,000 on their best nights, 3,000 a night. So there was only between 400 and $600 in tips to split up every night. And they got through it and it, it worked out great. So there are opportunities for bars like this, but you need to make sure your concept is designed to make you money. It, mean, it needs to make sales, particularly. So when you're doing a concept, make sure you're thinking about that. One of the best things I was ever told about concept is make sure your concept, design it to be busy at 2 a.m. on a Monday and you'll never fail. Think about that. Monday is typically the slowest day. 2 a.m. is a late hour, it's a, it's a slow hour. If you're busy, Monday. 2 a.m., you can't fail. There's no way you can fail. 
So design your concept to be cool, 2 a.m. on a Monday. And this came from Sean Muldoon and his investor. And Sean Muldoon owns the Dead Rabbit in New York City. His great concept was taking a pub, the Irish pub, putting great cocktails together. Which hadn't really been done when he did it with the Dead Rabbit, as far as Irish pubs specifically. And he killed it. The Dead Rabbit is still one of the best bars in the United States right now. But the genius of that is that he's got a bar that serves good food, good solid food, but cocktails are the focus and he's open all the time, right? And he's got a tap room downstairs that's more maybe beers and shots and simple cocktails. And upstairs is the cocktail bar that's really focused on serious cocktails. He really understood his concept was bringing two things that weren't typically together together and that's what made him valuable. That's what made him something people wanted to go see. Another great inspiration in terms of concept was April Bloomfield in New York City. She really brought the gastropub to New York City. And the gastropub is the English concept that Sean Muldoon was kind of sharing. And that's the British idea that a pub, which is known for its great beer, could also be a great place to eat and had better food. So she was raising the food levels like Sean was raising the cocktail levels in the concept and really putting those two things together. And the genius of this plan is that it couldn't fail because April was busy at midnight at the Spotted Pig in the West Village all the time. People would wait in line to eat at the Spotted Pig at midnight on any day of the week because the food was so good, it was the cool place to be, and if you needed late night food, that was where you went. And so she expanded her hours from just five to 10, the normal dinner hours, to five to close, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Sean Muldoon did the same thing. He expanded his hours from open at five or six all the way to close late in the wee hours, still serving food if you needed to, but really serving cocktails that whole time. And so make sure your concept works as far as when you're selling things, how you're selling things, is it a bar concept, is it a restaurant concept? If you're doing a restaurant, that's great. Is the kind of food you're making going to be profitable? All right, there are certain foods that are obviously very profitable, like steak can be very profitable, but you're, you're charging people an arm and a leg and you have to have the equipment to go with it. And that can be very expensive, like 1200 degree broilers. And But if you're opening up a bar who does steaks, do you really have that broiler? Or are you just pretending like you have that broiler? because the steaks aren't the same that way. If you're doing food, Mexican cuisine is notoriously cheap as in terms of cost. So you can charge a lot for it because people enjoy it. People are willing to spend the money on it. Good Mexican cuisine, but the cost is really low for that type of food, generally speaking. Another one is Cajun Creole food. These are peasant style food cultures that came from very poor economic areas at the time that they were developed and really grew. Now they're inexpensive to make still. And so make sure if you're doing a food concept, do not let yourself get buried under a food concept that is very expensive. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the space in terms of what you need for particular concepts. The space is really important. You have to have enough seats in order to make money. Each seat is worth a certain number of sales per year, which means a certain number of profit for you. It can't be the tiniest of tiniest spaces most likely and still make enough money for it to be worth your while to own it. So you do need some space. Do you have a kitchen, a space for a really long bar. If you're a cocktail bar, you want as many people surrounding your cocktail bartenders as possible. If you're a restaurant, you want seated tables, you want booths. Depending on the concept you're looking for, if you're going into a space that once was something else, it probably should be something that was close to what you're doing. Maybe if you're doing a cocktail bar, maybe that was already a bar in a bar focused neighborhood. Or if you're running a restaurant, maybe you wanna be in a space that used to be a restaurant so that its kitchen is already built out and you know it already functioned on some level so you don't have to invest a ton of money into it. If you're building out a space, you need to spend money on an architect, perhaps an interior designer as well, to really consider how the space looks and feels for your concept specifically. And you need to know what you're doing when you design a bar and how many people in a cocktail concept your bartenders can serve at one time at max filled out capacity. Don't overlook the space in terms of what you need to make money. Now, when you go into a space, the way you break it down is you try and get floor plans, if you can, from either your real estate agent or whoever owns the building should have building drawings and plans that can give you a loose floor plan. Within that floor plan, you're gonna to wanna to break it down into 14 square feet per guest, and that's in guest space only. So you're gonna to need to subtract out offices, kitchen, bar space, hallways, walkways, okay? Any pillars that you're not actually sticking tables around in order for it to fit 
just guest space. And then when you get your guest space, just where guests can live, right? Then you divide that by roughly 14 feet per person, maybe 15. If you have a higher end restaurant, it might be 17. Uh, places like 11 Madison Park probably have 20 square feet per guest. It depends on the concept you're doing. McDonald's has eight feet, right? But if you split it in half, you can get a rough occupancy for the space that you have. And that's very important. You also can look at whatever the occupancy was of the business that was there before it, if it already had a certificate of occupancy. Those are usually posted on the wall. Even if the business is out, they probably still have their old certificate of occupancy on the wall because that's where it needed to be posted and they may have just not taken it down. So you can get a capacity that way. So once you know what the space can do for you, now we need to move into the neighborhood. Now, what do I mean by the neighborhood? You need to look at the demographics of your neighborhood. The demographics of a neighborhood are oftentimes already done for you because any location that really wants businesses to join and come into their, their locales will do demographic studies for you. Well, that's what kind of people live there. Are they young? Are they old? You can learn how many kids are usually in each household, uh, how much household income is available, and then you'll learn the ages and incomes roughly of who's out and about. Now, generally speaking, you want single women between 25 and 35, and you want single men between 21 and 30, okay? That's just generally the people who go out and go to bars and have drinks, okay? But that doesn't necessarily hold all the time. You also need to look at, do the people in the neighborhood have lots of children? And if your concept is a nighttime concept, and during the day in the neighborhood, you see nothing but strollers, be careful because parents Parents, no matter what age they are or what they make in household income, if they have children and lots of them, two to three, maybe four in the neighborhood, they're not coming out for drinks at night. They're exhausted. They're taking cut. They're working during the day and they're coming home at night, putting their kids to bed and going like this. Okay. So they're not going to be out at your restaurant. So be careful about those neighborhoods. Also pay attention to if you have dual income, no kids. There's a reason that gay neighborhoods are great for restaurants because largely gay neighborhoods are dual income, no kid households generally. And so they have money to spend on things like restaurants and bars and clothes or whatever else. So what you want to find out is does your neighborhood have expendable income? Maybe that age group, but single, not married with kids at 25 to 35. If you're gonna go a little older, maybe even uh, you're in a neighborhood that's post-retirement. Okay, that's great because now retired folks may have expended expendable income. They've worked their whole lives so that they didn't have to worry about money anymore. And maybe you're in a neighborhood that uh, has an older generation, right? And maybe you design your concept to make them happy. But hey, even if you have kids in the neighborhood, maybe you're a lunchtime space. Maybe the nannies or the moms can come to lunch and have a space that's designed just for them and their kids to hang out. Maybe you have a daycare concept. Upstairs is a daycare. You can come free daycare. If you have drinks downstairs, we'll take care of your kids and you have licensed daycare professionals upstairs or there's a small fee for it or something. And mom can hang out downstairs and that's a great lunchtime for her. So you can design the concept around the demographics, but you gotta know the demographics. Another thing you wanna look for is do people come in from outside areas to your neighborhood? In which case, where are they coming from? You wanna know the demographics of where they're coming from. So a place like Adams Morgan in Washington DC is a perfect example. Lots of people came in from outside, particularly on the weekends to hang out there. And what do they like? What do they want? So you can design your concept around that. And then you really wanna focus also on where business happens during the week, where it happens on the weekends. Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is it weekend? Is it day weekday? And those really matter for when you're gonna be open, what hours, when you're gonna be paying paying people to keep your place going and serving others. And so you really wanna pay attention to that sort of thing as well. If you have a business that isn't successful on a Monday, you could be in trouble. You really wanna design your concept to be busy on a Monday at 2 a.m. or at worst Monday, period. If your business is busy on a Monday, you're gonna be all right. So make sure there's enough business during the week to even make it worthwhile. And if there isn't, then you gonna to need to be sure that you can get 80% of your profit out of the weekends, okay? And one more thing to notice, is the business seasonal in your neighborhood? Maybe you're located by a lake, like the place I'm looking at right now is located near a lake. Is it a lake? where people live or is it a lake where people's second house is there and they come visit during the warm months and then they're ghosting it during the winter months? Is it seasonal? Maybe you're near a tourist location where it's really about the summer months to get it in and without those summer months, you're not gonna do well. Or maybe you're in the north of the United States where it's cold during the winter, but your, most of your business is gonna come from a patio where you just became seasonal and you need to understand what happens during the summer months and the winter months can you survive the winter months by having a lot of sales during the summer? 
make sure your neighborhood seasonal changes are clearly understood and you have a grasp of what's going on. Another thing regarding the neighborhood that you're gonna wanna look into and be very careful about is what kind of liquor licenses are there available and being issued in the neighborhood at the time? As an example, in the District of Columbia, the Adams Morgan neighborhood was always known as a bar district. People would come in from all over the place to hang out, especially on the weekends, in this bar district, which made it one of the most known have fun districts in the District of Columbia. But the people in the Adams Morgan area who live there decided they wanted more restaurants and less bars. They were tired of the ruckusness of bars and their way of solving that was to convince the District of Columbia to stop issuing tavern licenses, which are licenses they allow to sell as much alcohol and beverage as they want, food if they want, but not necessarily. And that tavern license is really essential if you want to open a bar, particularly without a kitchen. They wanted more food focused restaurants in order to calm down the neighborhood, maybe bring the hours in from late 2 a.m., people being out in the streets down to maybe 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Well, if you have a restaurant license, you need to sell at least 35% food, it might even be 40 40% food in order to maintain that license and continue to have it. And you have to prove that by giving your sales to the board that issues the liquor license so that they can confirm that you're selling enough food to fit the restaurant license tag that you have. If you didn't know that and you wanted to open a bar, you might get stuck having to build out a kitchen that you didn't know about. If you already signed the lease, you may not have an option to get out after you sign the lease and now you have to build a kitchen. Guess what you need to do to build a kitchen? Raise lots of money because kitchens are expensive. So you really need to know the laws and regulations, particularly around beverage licenses. Is it being transferred to you through the building or do you need to get it from the previous owner of said restaurant that you're buying? Those processes you need to understand fully. And I highly recommend you get a liquor attorney. There are people who deal specifically with this and I think they're worth getting specifically so that you can understand what you're going to have to go through and what it's going to cost you in order to get open. Other professionals you're going to want to look into, do not skip this. You're going to want to look into perhaps a real estate agent. Now you don't have to necessarily pay this real estate agent. If you're just looking to lease spaces, the building owners are paying these real estate agents to hunt you down and get you out into the spaces that they want to sell. And so these real estate agents will take you from places the place without any cost of, to you at the time, there may be a fee associated later on with closing the deal and having you sign a lease. You may have to pay that real estate agent some piece based on what the lease says. But in general, they're working for the guys who own the building, trying to get people interested in the lease get them in the building. These guys are great for demographic data, what you should be paying per square foot in the area relative to what other people have already paid. So you're not getting bilked unknowingly by a overzealous building owner who wants to get more than he really should be getting based on the market. Stuart Diamond produced a great book called Getting More how to negotiate to achieve your goals in the world. It's an amazing book that gives you an idea of how to negotiate things and who to negotiate with. Little things in this book really helped me out. Like the simple question at the end of a negotiation, maybe you're done and you're cool with whatever price has been set for whatever you're buying. And then you say the words that he tells you to say, which is, is this the best you can do? That simple question has saved me thousands and thousands of dollars over my lifetime because I simply had the patience to ask it at the end of the negotiation. You'd be surprised at how often and someone's like, oh, fine, I'll knock $500 off that price. Or, oh man, all right, do it this way and I'm cool with it, it'll be less. Whatever they're giving you is something you wouldn't have gotten had you simply not asked the question. Remember these words, is this the best you can do? Always ask it at the end of every negotiation. After you feel all this stuff out, concept, space, and neighborhood, then you're gonna do sales projections. Now sales projections are gonna require you learn spreadsheets. I highly recommend you start watching YouTube and look up some basic Google Sheets or Excel spreadsheet YouTube tutorials that teach you basic stuff. The necessity when I'm doing a sales projection of any more than just learning how to do basic sum equations, maybe some multiplication, it's pretty simple stuff. You really can do this stuff, but when you get to the spreadsheet, you're gonna want to put in your menu price per person. And what is that? That's how much each person on average comes in and spends at your establishment. And that really depends on your menu. What are you offering and at what price? Now, for instance, I run a cocktail concept that's really focused on democratizing cocktails. So it's called a cocktail tavern concept. It's very similar to Sean Muldoon's pub cocktail concept. The idea is we're democratizing cocktails so that they they're in a regular bar environment, like a pub, like a tavern, but they're served right alongside of beer and wine, which tend to be a little less expensive. 
and my price point, let's just say, it's right around $12. Food is also served. We'll be known for our cocktails, but we serve these other things and we don't skimp on those things. They're at great quality. Now, what is my price point? Well, if cocktails are 12, beers are six or seven, and wine is $9 a glass, well, I can start to get a price point. You wanna price them in somewhere in the range of two to two and a half drinks per person. If you serve food and your food's popular or you think it will be popular, then maybe you add in just an appetizer to the average price per person because some people are gonna come in and just have a drink or two and some people are gonna come in and go full on dinner. So you wanna get the average. And this is a bit of conjecture, but if you know your menu prices and you know your neighborhood, you can probably figure it out. So if I had $12 cocktails plus $9 wines and six to $7 beers, and maybe anywhere between eight to $12 appetizers, and I have entrees 15 to 20, what we're gonna have is an average price per person, about $35. I do about two drinks plus an appetizer, 30 to $35. Then you're gonna wanna do what I call a turn-based analysis. Turn-based analysis is a restaurant's way of valuing your business. So there are many ways of valuing a business, if you're a bar owner already and you have a, another bar open, you can use sales from that bar to really project how much you're gonna make in this future bar. This video is really about a bartender starting a new bar, their first bar. So the way you're gonna do it is you're gonna go in and you know you know your neighborhood. You know what kind of business your neighborhood does on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, because you did the research. You went and, you went and watched what happened in the neighborhood at the other restaurants and bars. And you know roughly what you can bring in in terms of people based on your occupancy and based on what you've seen in the neighborhood. And you can start to conjecture what you think you can do on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and figure out how many people can come in on a Monday. Do you think you can serve 35 people? Okay, great. Get 35 people in on Monday. Maybe you have trivia on a Wednesday and you're like, hey, I can get a couple extra people. Maybe you have an occupancy of 50 and you can do two turns on a Wednesday because of your trivia. Great. Trivia is awesome. That's 100 people that can come in. 100 times your price per person is your sales that day. If your price per person is 35, you just sold $3,500 on a Wednesday. Then you can take those daily sales based on your daily turns and you can project out your yearly projected sales. And this is really important. Now, if you're in a seasonal place, something that's really doing well in summer, you're gonna have to do projections for both. Your winter doldrum months and your summer great months or your patios open months, patios closed months. So make sure you break it down by space. So you want your main bar, maybe your tiki bar outside that's only open during the summer. Okay, now you gotta limit it down to just the months you're actually open with heaters or whatever. Maybe it's eight months, maybe it's nine months, maybe it's four months, cause it's only summer. Either way, you're gonna have to trim down your sales based on when you're gonna be open and you're gonna come up with your yearly projected sales. Once you get your yearly projected sales, you need to, at that point, figure out, is it worth your time? Do you see enough sales that you think there's enough room for profit in order to interest investors and interest yourself in getting open? And what's really important there is once you know your sales per year, let's say you have a million dollar business, but it costs you a million dollars to open the business. Is it worth your while? I promise you it will not be. There's not enough money every year to make back money for yourself and your investors. You're either gonna suffer because you don't have enough equity in the profits that you make, or your investors aren't gonna be making enough money to be interested in investing in your place. It's simply too expensive if your sales are only gonna be a million dollars to put a million dollars into a build out before you even open. But if your restaurant's going to make $2 million a year and it costs 500,000 to open, now we're starting to talk because $2 million in sales represents likely a very good profit percentage that you can work with if you only need to raise 500,000 to open it. And your investors will get paid back in around three years and you will hold enough equity, enough share of, this, of the profits to be happy on a yearly basis where you're, you're being paid for the hard work and risk that you took to open the business. And I can't be more assertive about this. Make sure the percentage of the business for you is big enough that you feel like it's worth your time and your effort and your blood, sweat and tears. And it's worth the risk you took because you put your ass on the line to go out and build a restaurant. Your reputation, who you are as a business person, that's risk. And you need to be paid for taking that risk. So if your percentage of the share of profits is too small for you to be happy, you got to back out right now. And that's why you do this work and this research that we're talking about today up front. You want to make sure that you know exactly where you're moving into. You need to know exactly the space and the concept and why people are going to be interested in coming to see you as a restaurant or as a bar. Then you're going to find out if it's profitable. Now, if you really want to get to profits, you're going to need to then do a labor breakdown. You need to know how many humans you're going to need in the restaurant or bar working 
working for you, including management, who you're gonna pay, how much salary you're gonna pay. You're also gonna need to hire bartenders. They're gonna be required to get hourly and so forth. And you need to know that roughly you can serve with one bartender, 20 to 25 people in a cocktail concept. Now, if, if you're just pulling pints, serving shots, you can maybe bump that up to 40, 50, but their great service from bartenders really starts to wane after 40 people. And great service from cocktail focused bartenders starts to wane after about 25 people in their purview. Okay, so keep that in mind when you try and figure out how many people you're gonna need to work during a shift. And then do you have people managing them to make sure everything goes smoothly to help them during service and then close them out at night? Or maybe your bartenders are also managers and they close themselves out at night. I like that process, but you need to know what you're paying the managers to watch the business for you when you're not there. And then in the kitchen, this really comes down to what kind of chef you hire and so forth, but you really, you're gonna need porters who clean the dishes. You're gonna need a colds. You're gonna need a hots. You might need a saucier and you might need a grill person. It's roughly five people in the kitchen working just to produce your food. And then the chef and the chef might need a day or two off. So who's gonna sue chef when he's out of the kitchen getting his days off? And make sure you don't have a chef working seven days. That's not okay. Okay, everyone needs a day off make sure the chef isn't running every day because he'll get burned out and unhappy too quickly. Once you figure that out, you can subtract out labor from your total sales. You also want to subtract out tax. Once you subtract all that labor out and you subtract your sales tax out, you're getting closer. Now you have your yearly fixed costs, which are your utilities, your insurance, any money you might spend on advertising or media, and you start to tally these things up and you subtract your yearly costs. Now you're pretty close to what it, your yearly income is in profit will be. And once you get that profit number, now you know how much money the business can actually make and whether it's worth asking investors to invest to build it out, to get it open, and whether it's worth your time as an owner to own the bar. So this is all work you've done. Now you know your bar can probably make the money you need. You know the concept, you know the space, and you know the neighborhood down packed. All right, guys. That's the video about the beginnings of opening your own bar or restaurant. I hope this helps and I hope you guys are learning something that really helps you in the future because I wanna see you guys opening your own bars and restaurants if you're a bartender hungry to do that. And this is where you start. This is your own work and this is what you need to do. Space, concept, neighborhood, sales projection, know the neighborhood, laws and regulations. I want you guys to know those things and focus on you and your concept first. Make sure it's really nailed down. I love you guys, thank you for supporting me and as always, to better drinks. Let me know where you think you should open a bar or if you have a cool concept, let me know in the comments and we'll see you guys later. Take care.